listening to Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. Out of the Box is sponsored by HugMeTees.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTees.com. Guys, we are now on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash Out of the Box Podcast, and as always on Stitcher and iTunes. If you like the podcast, go on iTunes and click on the subscribe button. That really helps us out a lot to get new subscribers, so I really appreciate that. I am so excited. I am here today with Dale Stevens. He has a new book out called Hacking Your Education and is the founder of Uncollege.org. Dale, how are you? I'm doing well. Good. Um, So I had uh, one of your content contributors on a couple weeks ago, and she was very interesting. And I want to know what um, inspired you to start the website. I started Uncollege.org out of my frustrations with my freshman year of college. Um, I, like most high school seniors, I was, I spent, I spent a lot of time and effort thinking about where I was going to go to college. It was presented to me by my parents and society as the, the place where I would go to, to find myself and explore the world. Um, and I felt like so, so much weight rested on this one de- decision. When I got to college, uh, I was really frustrated by the extent to which there wasn't actually really a lot of intention put into why people were there. Um, people were choosing classes kind of haphazardly. Yes, they were interesting, but they weren't particularly relevant or, or practical. Uh, so I got I got pretty frustrated with my with my first semester, and um, I'd been used to having a lot of say in in how I learned. I actually left because you were unschooled, teaching. correct? Which is yeah, so a type of must, um, not non traditional schooling. Yeah, so unschooling is this like this self directed form of homeschooling, and I had, so I, I I left the traditional classroom when I was twelve. Um, and spent 12 to 18 uh, working in collaborative learning groups with my peers, uh, volunteering on projects, helping start small businesses, um, essentially making the world my classroom. And that experience led me to have a lot of agency and control over over how I learned. Um, So, you know, it was was the kind of experience that I I wish more, more children could have. Um, but it also made me realize how just how u- unique it was. Um, and so I, I started on college because I, I, I wanted more 18-year-olds to have the sense of, of agency and control um, over their own lives that I did uh, when I was 18. There seems to be a lot of irrelevancy with the um, higher education system in general. You know, a lot of students go to school. You know, I want to talk about your gap year because I think that's really important. A lot of kids go to school. And like you said, you know, the first two years are general studies classes. They're studying things they're not interested in or maybe even changing majors two or three, four times or sometimes graduating and then not even doing what they studied in college. Yeah, it's it's kind of mind boggling. Um, I think what's what's even more mind-boggling is that half of all students who enroll in college drop out, right? Um, and so there's 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 been this huge push at the national level to get everyone to go to college, and there's not the same emphasis on 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 completion or even making sure that the students who go to college are are getting degrees in the right things. Um, I don't there think was, any... there also is a lack of actual learning. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds yeah. kind of silly. There's but that too. I went to a traditional college and I, you know, feel like I learned more out of college than actually in it. I just, I felt like everyone was there to just get through the motion so they could get a degree. Yeah. And for many, for many, that's, that's why they are there. Um, college has become a, a rite of passage, essentially. It's what you do to, to become an adult in the States. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, there's, there's certainly a place in society for that, but it doesn't necessarily need to take four years and cost 200 grand. Yeah, <laughs> that's a very good point and puts you into indentured servitude with debt, which is what a lot of people are doing. Um, so what is Gap Year for those of um, listeners who don't understand what it is? You're offering a program where people can learn more about themselves, right? Yeah, so we run gap year programs for people who are taking time off between high school and college who want to who want to maximize their higher education experience, whether they go back to college or to another training program or they directly enter the workforce. We have a curriculum and coaching process that helps people understand who they are, how they learn, and, and what they want to do with, with their lives for a tenth of the price and a quarter of the cost of college. So, um, what kind of things are you guys teaching that maybe is not taught in a traditional college? Our curriculum is all around creation, curiosity, and self-advocacy. So this, the workshops that we have are things like how do you negotiate, communicate, keep yourself motivated, have difficult conversations, uh, give and get feedback, work in a team, 
all the kinds of things that you that you do every day for the rest of your life, but no one bothers to actually explicitly teach. So basically, you're it's like the school of life, right? Yeah, <laughs> and we, we we try and make it we try and make it as practical as possible, and we try and mimic how the real world works as much as we can. Now, um, you started on college off of a fellowship that you received, a program. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to be selected as part of uh, the first class of Teal Fellows, which is a program that recognized the top 20 entrepreneurs around the world under the age of 20. Um, the program is now five years old, and it was started by Peter Teal, who's the uh, co-founder of PayPal and was one of the first investors in Facebook. Um, he wanted to, to put some put some money behind the notion that not all great innovation comes from four-year colleges. Um, so he funded, funded 20 people and, and continues to, to do so to, to innovate um, in the real world, essentially. And that was, a, it was an excellent opportunity to, to step outside uh, university and have, have some, some validation for what I was doing. Um, and it, it, you know, the, the biggest thing that the fellowship gave me was was credibility. People were willing to say, "Oh, you're you're you know you're doing this thing that someone has who has a reputation is is backing. You must not be totally crazy." <laughs> did you feel a little bit like how so? How long did you actually attend college before you before you left? About a semester and a half. Okay, so a pretty short time. <laughs> yes. A very what short were time. some of your frustrations with traditional college? <sighs> so many. Um, <laughs> I mean, college is, is a really, really great place uh, to go if, if you can afford it, right? Um, it's designed well for people who, who love learning, who want to pursue knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Uh, but for the vast majority of people, they go to college as a, as a means to an end, right? College is sold as part of the American dream, as a, as a stepping stone to a better future. Um, and yeah, it's true across the board that people who go to college end up making more over the over the course of their their lifetimes. You know, there's a lot of caveats to that, such as if you you know if you overlay the graph of of uh, real earnings of college grads versus college debt, you can actually see in the last 15 years that that real earnings are going down while debt is still going up. Um, so it, you know, at, at some point that will that will start to be less true. It's also true that it, you know what what you major in matters matters immensely, right? Um, the delta in earnings between high school graduates and people who went to college and majored in communications or the humanities is not nearly as large as those who went to college and majored in in STEM fields, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it's uh, it's very easy to get caught up in in the rhetoric of wanting to say that everyone should get a higher education, and, and that's great if you can. Um, but for, for many people, that's, that's not the case. I mean, we have a lot of students who come into our program who are choosing to do it and choosing a different option, um, by, by necessity because their parents can't pay for college. Um, and the only way to do it would be, would be to take on 30 or 40 grand a year in debt every year. Uh, and like you said, if by the, by the time you, 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 you graduate, you're indentured to a bank. Um, and you're forced to take the first thing that comes along, as opposed to even having the time to to pursue something that you might be that you might think is a little bit better fit. Um, I noticed that a lot of um, alternative education advocates like you are very diplomatic when it comes to talking about traditional education. But, you know, I would have to disagree a little bit with, you know, I think the statistics are touted and kind of shoved down people's throats that, um, you know, attending a four-year college overall, you're going to make more money. But that's not necessarily true, I don't think, this day and age. And if you really want to be a huge success, it tends to be people I've noticed that are insane entrepreneurs where they're in the top percentile of um, American entrepreneurship or, or you know, um, international entrepreneurship. They're all college dropouts is what I've noticed. It's definitely true. It's definitely true. <laughs> I'm just saying. I think you're being a little bit diplomatic about college. Um, <laughs> I, I, I am. You know, I, I've, I've, I've trained myself to be, to be di di diplomatic about colleges because we, you know, we, we, we want to work with colleges and we want to, we want to help them, help them change themselves to change um, the current model. I think the current model doesn't yeah. work that well, and I think it's, it's unfortunately a dying dinosaur. Um, do you think? 
you know, the internet has changed any of this. Now there's Khan Academy and all these different, you know, free uh, classes online that before you would be paying thousands of dollars to, uh, you know, get through a traditional education. I think that the internet has made the access to information so much easier than it, than it was a decade ago, right? Um, and that's that's really cool and really exciting. Um, I think you know we saw we saw last week. There's this announcement that that ASU is uh, is offering the their first freshman year online for six thousand um, dollars, and and you know we're that's. I think the, the things that will change the game are the, are the combinations of these programs. I think in the, in the long run, what we'll see is we'll see communities of people coming together to learn um, popping up um, where you see people living and learning together, but perhaps taking all, all, all their classes online. There's, you know, there's infrastructure around um, the community and, and mentorship aspects of colleges uh, that I think will have to get built out in order for all the resources that are available online to be pro- properly used. So do you mean something like um, taking uh, a course online, but then having group discussions about maybe a book if you're in an English class with other people in your community, something like that? Yeah. So I mean, there's, there's some very serious conversations going on with people that I, that I interact with about, you know, what, is the, what does the 21st century dorm look like? Uh, once you have all these people who are in in independent learning programs, you know why aren't they all living together? Um, and you know once you once you co-located them, what are all the what are the other pieces of a college experience that you could re-aggregate? Right? What does the twenty first century alumni network look like? Uh, you know what do student clubs look like if people are engaging in their own? independent learning experiences. There's all these different aspects of the college experience that are really important. And, and you know, adults, adults will cite as an incredibly important part of their college experience, um, but can be totally reinvented outside uh, of a campus in the middle of, of, of Iowa. Yeah, maybe you can have, you know, a Harvard professor teaching different people across the country instead of just in Boston. Yeah. Something or, like that. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, maybe, maybe there's... Uh, 50 people who come together to live together for nine months in a dorm in an, any number of, of high-impact global cities uh, and are able to access a network that's put together um, of experts to give them feedback on, on what they're working on while they're taking their courses independently online. Um, so you talk about Gap Year. What, the program is... Um, featured through uncollege.org and people have to sign up and apply for it. Is it uh, like a lottery or people pick depending on what they, um, uh, what their interests are or can anyone apply? Anyone can apply. We try to select for people who are good at being self-directed. So we look for people who have evidence of working on projects, who've solved problems in their communities, who've gone above and beyond just what it takes to, to succeed in school. We get about... Uh, we get about a, a thousand applications a year for for forty five slots, um, and so we we're, we're lucky to be able to to narrow those down to the right kind of people. Um, and in many ways, the process is, is somewhat self selective. Right? It's you know we, we we run a program that is inherently for people that, that don't like like programs. So we have to walk this line <laughs> okay. of providing enough support um, for for our. Our, our students, but also uh, giving them enough freedom so, so that they can they can pursue their own projects. And I think that's the that the coaching model. Every student has a coach that they work one on one with to help them set goals and contextualize information, connect, connect connect to the right resources and mentors. That model, I think, is is what allows that relationship to to develop and thrive. Now it's forty five um, at the students that are picked, and then is it? certain inter- industries only or is it just you know whatever it's, they want to learn our fellows have, have pursued everything from uh creative writing to singing and songwriting to design to technology to real estate it's really all across the board uh, i think that's one of the that's one of the virtues of our program is that we can we can help students narrow in on on what they want to do and help them build a plan for how to get there well, that sounds really great. Um, where do you guys find your mentors from? Within the community or 
So we have we have two full time coaches uh, who 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 essentially serve as as the emotional spiritual life mentors for our fellows, right? So they're the ones that they they meet consistently with every week over the over the course of the year, uh, and then they lean on on mentors in our community for for subject specific resources. And this is such a um, transformational time for people, you know, in that age range. You're just getting to be a young adult. So it's really important for you to discover who you are. And I think, you know, sometimes being in a traditional college atmosphere can actually dull that because it's, it's very, I know when I initially started um, my college career, I just felt kind of like dumped off in the middle of somewhere and I didn't know what I was doing. So (laughs) is this a common theme that is, is felt among the students that you've talked to? I certainly think that you know most most adults that we talk to say something like, "Wow, you know, I really really wish this had been around when I was seventeen. <laughs> like, I should not have been sent off to college when I was seventeen. I was just going crazy. I had no idea what I wanted." Um, and that's I think that's the you know that's that's a huge theme in terms of in terms of why we're why we're doing what we're doing. This is the kind of experience that we wish that we'd have um, when we when we were young. Um, Certainly, colleges are you know colleges are, are great at you know having big libraries and, and well known well known faculty, but they're not really very good at, at providing one on one emotional support. Their their academic advising services are really just set up to help you stack stack courses to uh, to graduate on time. And there's not the the existential questions or the relationships that are built to help students ask the really important questions of. Who am I? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Right? Am I doing pre-med because I want to become a doctor, or you know, would it make more sense to like pursue public health if I really just care about helping people? Right? There's not these the the, the the larger questions about why you're doing what you're doing aren't aren't frequently asked. And those existential questions are really important because I know at least a handful of people who chose certain majors or degrees or or courses of study. Not even because they wanted to help people or because of whatever reason, but just because they're being peer pressured by maybe family members. Yeah, parents parents certainly have a, a nasty little habit of um, wanting their children to fulfill their own expectations. <laughs> As a psychologist once said, the unfulfilled life of the parent is the life projected onto the child. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> That's that's a it's definitely a, a common theme that 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 we see. Whenever I I run across parents who are really able to, to take a step back and let their children um, live their own dreams, it's so rewarding. It is, and I think I think that that's why you know I really want to praise you for that, those existential things because some people, you know, never ask those questions until you know maybe they have a life or death experience or perhaps that you know infamous midlife crisis when they're saying wait why did I just do this for 10 15 20 years and so I think that's really great that you guys are going to the root of the why because that you know it seems silly when you have bills to pay and and mouths to feed if you have kids and stuff to sit around and say why am I doing this what is the purpose of this but that can you know really lead someone down the wrong life if they're not present to what their intentions are yeah absolutely absolutely um do you find that it is kind of like a, a lot of self-discovery since you guys are dealing with emotional intelligence, spirituality, not maybe not in a religious sense, but um, those type of questions that are not addressed in the mainstream educational system? Absolutely. I mean, we think of we think we think what we're really good at is helping people have a transformative experience. Um, our our coaches are people who have a deep background in social and emotional learning, and, and their role is to help students have asked those questions and, and figure out answers in a meaningful way. You know, often that's hard and difficult and not very fun and can, can result in a lot, of, a lot of wrestling and writing and, and, uh, uh, and seeking to, to find the answer. Um, but engaging in that process is, is part of life. It is. Um, are there any ever any difficult times in gap year, crying, sharing, thing, times when people are just really frustrated or feel you know, um, confused? Yeah, so every, every Friday we have a process called Friday Review where everyone gets together, reflects on their week, um, talks about what's going on for them, both in terms of the program as well as 
anything that, that they're dealing with personally. Um, and those can often be times where, where we've set an expectation that um, it's, a, it's a safe space to share. Um, and those can, be, those can be times where, where, where there are tears, where there's laughter. Um, but having, having a safe space where you, where you feel that you can share those things, I think is you know, incredibly important for an 18-year-old. Um, I think that know, sounds incredibly I, important for every, anyone. Yeah, <laughs> Some totally, people don't have totally. that. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, when you're, when you're 18, you don't really want to listen to your parents, right? <laughs> Subconsciously, you know that, that they know more than you do, but you don't really want to listen to them. And so having a, having a facilitator who's a little bit, who's, who's 10 or 15 years older than you um, and, and seems a little bit, feels a little bit more like a peer than your parent does uh, can be really helpful in helping students process um, who they are, what they want to do, how they want to live, what they've done so far, whether or not they're living up to their parents' expectations, what people think of them, you know, all the, all the kinds of questions that run, run through your head as you're trying to make choices about your life. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like a big brother or big sister that's that you you would rather listen to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so you have a book out, hacking your education, and you know you're providing resources for people to learn outside of the classroom. What are some um, alternative um, resources you would recommend to the average person who maybe doesn't feel like they're learning as much as they could, or they're you know taking these boring classes or something that they just didn't really relate to? I mean, there's. I think the it, it starts with with having a, a, a desire to learn more, right? Um, there's a lot of people who who get into college after high school and and want to check out because they've had such a, a disengaging experience, and you can't blame anyone for that, right? Um, but I think I think it starts with with really sort of understanding why it's important to 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 work hard. Um, so I I think some of the you know, books like uh, The Power of Habit and Influence and some of these books that, that talk more broadly about um, how you can have an impact on the world and how uh, what you do on a daily basis matters and, and, and adds up are a really good place to start. So having a conscious awareness, you know, I think a lot of people, like you said, are kind of burnt out from the memorization, the test taking, and it's getting worse with a lot of standardized testing where kids are not being taught to learn or think creatively they're just taught to memorize so um that's definitely an issue that we have and you said you guys were working with colleges you're you're looking to um reinvent or restructure or inspire um the current educational system um how would you recommend implementing some of the things that you guys are teaching into the traditional college system i think it'll start by having having a, a college who who recognized recommends our program and, and maybe we'll start giving their students credit for some of it, and I think that the natural extension is that uh, you know maybe part of our experience could become a replacement for the freshman year experience. Um, you know, basically every other developed country in the world, their undergrad degrees are only three years long, not four. Um, that's part of what makes our system so darn expensive. Um, and I think that I this did kind not of know experience. That. Yeah, all of all of Europe and all of Asia and Australia and basically everywhere else has three-year undergrad degrees. Is it less um, general education requirements and more focused on your your area of study, or typically? Yeah, I mean, typically you you concentrate in a particular area of study earlier on as well. Um, so you think implementing a program like this, and also you know, a lot of people college or you know maybe even a program like this might may not be right for them and I think that's something that is okay and people need to accept a lot of people you know you just hear college after high school college after high school you're going to be a failure in life and you know for some people higher education not necessarily not learning but higher education may not be right for them and that's something that's rarely discussed yeah I mean there's there's certainly a lot of stigma in this country around apprenticeship programs and crafts and trade schools and all these other things that you can do with your life um, and I think it's you know that's that's really too bad um, in a lot of Europe there's a strong tradition of of respect for, for people who learn how to work with their hands and become carpenters or whatever it is right and that's a that's a specific skill that 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 is valued um, just... and I think that that you know that's that's partly a an, an issue with how this country is set up and the fact that, 
you still like have to worry about healthcare if you want to become an artist and all these kinds of things. Mm. And if we were able to able to implement um, uh, some more social standards that that would allow people to to make choices that would um, help them succeed without worrying about whether or, or not they have health insurance, you know, it would it would probably be better for everyone. Um, yes, totally agreed with. And, you know, there are other programs as well, like you said, apprenticeships and carpenters and other things that you can do. But also, you know, there's also other careers that don't necessarily require a college education. You know, you can be a realtor, you can be an insurance salesman. There's other things that it seems like they're not really discussed. Um, what I uh-huh. my experience has been that really the idea is, you know, to go to college or you're going to be, you know, working at McDonald's or something like that. It seems to be one or the other is what I've heard from many parents and many um, parts of our society, just pushing that one or the other and not realizing that there's other paths to success as well. Yeah. Have you had any pushback or any um, from traditional education systems or anyone, you know, just saying, Hey, you're, you're nuts. You're, you're, you know, advocating something that's not good for kids. When I when I started, definitely, um, and that's it's changed a lot in the last couple of years. This year, I, I went to South by Southwest Education for a third time and had a number of colleges approach me saying, "Hey, you know, we recognize that the system is is changing, uh, and we want to make sure that you know we'll we'll continue to to be around. So we want to figure out how we can work together." Um, that's really I think cool. that's. Yeah, and I think that's that's partly because we saw we saw two major colleges actually close in March. So Sweet Briar, which is a all girls school in Maryland with an eighty million dollar endowment, announced they were shutting down. In fact, at the end of this year, and a school in Iowa called AIB decided to donate themselves to the University of, of Iowa. Um, and people have been saying for a while that the way the way mid tier schools are operated is unsustainable. Um, but I think it was, you know, sort of a, a wake-up call for colleges to see, you know, whoa, these two two mid-tier schools uh, with sizable endowments have decided that they they cannot c- continue to operate. What does that mean for me? And there's other schools as well. A lot of schools are shutting down class loads and putting classes online. And um, there was a small college in Santa Fe, Santa Fe College, that um, also closed within the past few years. Yeah. So it seems to be a trend. Um, I'm so sad. Thank you for your knowledge. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up um, because of your busy schedule. <laughs> um, where can people find you? Where can people find out more about what's going on with Dale and in this movement? You can find out more about Uncollege at uncollege.org. Uh, we have a whole host of, of free resources about how to hack your education, uh, links to other other self-directed learning resources and and all kinds of things. We certainly want, uh, run a, a gap year program, but but we want to be uh, a resource for everyone first. And uh, what is your goal? What is your inspiration? You know, for continuing on this journey. Obviously, you are the founder, but um, usually people who create companies like this and other um, programs have a bigger vision for the world. So, what is your vision, Dale? That is inspiring you to continue on with this work. I think what's what's most rewarding for me is seeing people actualize their um, their human potential. Um, right now, we're doing that in the form of the gap year program, but there's just there's so much talent that's that's not being unlocked, and I would love to see more of that thrive um, and flourish, and not not get kept locked up because of societal expectations or parental fears or whatever it is that's stopping people from, from being themselves. Well, thank you so much for um, being with us today on Out of the Box Podcast. Thanks, Rosie. And as always, please visit outoftheboxpodcast.com and click on the donate button. We're now accepting Litecoins and Bitcoins for all of you alt currency junkies mm-hmm. out there. And um, go on iTunes and look up Out of the Box Podcast and leave a positive comment. We love positive comments. If you hate the podcast, leave a negative comment. I don't care. Just leave a comment because it helps our numbers go up in iTunes. It helps people find out about us. As always, we're on SoundCloud and Stitcher. And I am on Twitter at Funny Rosie. This has been Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. Mm-hmm.